Goals are for people that want to succeed once, and systems are for people that want to succeed all the time. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja. How are you today? Hey, Hadar. What's up? You know, everything is great. Everything is good. You know, we always talk about integrative dermatology, And I think there's that notion when you talk about integrative medicine and traditional medicine and alternative medicine that we're talking about old stuff, you know, things that happened 3,000 years ago. And it's mystical, right? You have to dig in through a cave and find this old jar with the secret sauce, right? But sometimes I think we forget that the idea of integrative medicine is to put everything together, including the future. And technology, my gosh, is exploding all around us, especially in the healthcare sector. And I thought maybe we can bring someone who's at the cutting edge, right there at the cusp, sitting right there at the edge of the wave, surfing through, maybe from California, all the way down to our podcast to kind of guide us how to think about integrative dermatology, but from a point of view of an entrepreneurship or new technologies that are emerging. What do you say? Dar, did you uncover a guy that's developed a lab to make crystals now so you don't have to go find them on your own? Is that what this is about? No, probably not, right? But yeah, we're talking innovation. We're talking innovative dermatology. And our guest today is Dr. Michael Abrook. He is a board-certified derm- dermatologist. He's also at the Wellman Labs for a laser fellowship. And so this guy is super innovative. I met him when he was rotating as a medical student when I was faculty at UC Davis, and I knew right away that this guy thought about things very differently. Michael, thanks for joining us on this podcast. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, guys. Hadar, Raja, this is an honor and excited to chat about innovation, building the future, and and everything in between. Yes, and you know, I thought maybe we can start, as always, in the beginning and talk about this idea, which I think you exemplify very well, the idea of entrepreneurship in medicine. You know, I think there's a lot of time this kind of thinking about the market and how companies are set up. But for someone who's coming to this for the first time, maybe you can give us your take on the idea of taking a scientific question, a scientific problem in medical terms, of course. And in my mind, there's a couple of ways to attack a problem, right? You can go the research route, go through NIH funding, for example, write a few papers, or you can go the commercial route and start a company, maybe write a couple of patents. You seem to have chosen the latter in most of your career so far. Can you tell us, how do you find that difference? What kind of problems deserve the kind of more commercial route, if you will, versus the more academic route? That's a fantastic question to dive right in on. And, you know, it's been a great experience up with the team at Harvard and a lot of the mentorship up here with Rox Anderson and the whole lab, as you mentioned, the Wellman Lab. For anyone that's listening, they've kind of had their hand involved in inventing or developing almost every device that we use in dermatology in lasers and energy-based devices, from laser hair removal to laser tattoo removal to cool sculpting, and the list goes on. So it's been really an honor to be sort of introduced and brought into that world and tackling things that are worth tackling. I think that's really the key on there is identifying problems that are worth solving and problems that are worth providing your effort towards. You know, not every problem is going to be the biggest problem. It's not like we're day in, day out trying to cure cancer and creating new gene therapies over here, but we're kind of trying to tackle bigger things that need solutions things that don't really have a good option. And some specific examples of ways that I look at this now are you want to have a lot of shots on goal. And that really goes back to sort of what you mentioned from the entrepreneurial route, looking at innovation as effectively its own microcosm of venture capital. A good venture capital firm doesn't invest in one idea and they don't bet the farm on one thing. You sort of bet on 
dozens or even more of ideas or devices or technologies and you invest those allocations accordingly. I think that's a really good principle for people starting out, especially throughout healthcare and beyond, because everyone on this call, everyone listening to this podcast has great ideas. It's a matter of decreasing the distance between ideas and innovation and decreasing the distance between concept and clinic. That's sort of the messy middle that becomes a challenge. And I think by having that sort of investment-based approach of having one, two, 10, 20 shots on goal. One of those might go in, 10 of those might be absolutely nothing and doesn't even move past an idea phase. And maybe another five or six of those sort of move midway and maybe have a successful financial exit, maybe have a successful clinical impact or somewhere in between. And I'd be happy to talk about some of the systems that we use over here to identify which are ideas that are worth moving forward and worth tackling. Michael, great point on the ideas. Hadar, you remember Dr. Rivka Isaroff, our mentor who really inspired us in the early stages. She used to tell us this. She used to say, everybody has an idea. Just because you have an idea doesn't mean you know how to execute it. So I feel like this is so apropos. So Michael, what do you have going that makes it so innovative? And maybe taking a step back, what's in your DNA that makes you want to do this? (laughs) Yeah, that's a really fair question. I think Steve Jobs said it the best where it was along the lines of anyone that's pursuing building a company or building something new, you've got to be a little bit crazy and a little bit stubborn and a little bit persistent to maybe a near pathological degree. And I do think that's a touch bit valid because, you know, we look at all these success stories and you look at these successful exits and these lucrative financial deals and these venture capital deals. But what you don't see is that messy middle between idea and pushing that forward, the failures, the repeated self-doubt, the repeated lack of financial commitment, the companies that go bankrupt. Those are the things that we don't see. You know, you see the Steve Jobs is the Elon Musk, the Rocks is everything in between, but it's pretty tough. You know, I'm going through a couple of those right now with a couple of the companies and devices that we are launching both here and independently. And it's a challenge. So back to the DNA question, I think really the core comes from being brutally honest with yourself. Is this something that you are willing to commit yourself to not for a year, not for five years, not for 10 years, but truly for the rest of your life. And it's a blessing and a curse. I think Kobe Bryant said it best that it's an obsession and it demands all of you. And that's maybe not a good thing at times, but it's something that you can't put down. I think that's a prerequisite from a DNA standpoint to really move these things forward. But I'll throw that back because I don't want to dissuade anyone. I want to inspire people on here that just because if you don't feel like that's maybe your ethos or your mold, that doesn't mean that you can't find a great co-founder that has that sort of caliber, that sort of quality that you can work with together and push ideas through. And it really does take an ecosystem to take companies to market and to take devices and technology to market. Yes. Thank you for saying that and mentioning the whole team and ecosystem kind of concept, because I was thinking, my gosh, it takes so much energy. And you just said, I need to have like 12 shots on goal. So (laughs) thank you for putting that in perspective. You know, I guess in some shots you are the lead and in some you are kind of in a supporting role, but you kind of keep trying and keep innovating, which is cool. And I think the other thing for the person who may be not that kind of, you know, Steve Jobs, you were mentioning that there's a few tactics that you use in the group to kind of try to weed out the bad ideas and kind of keep the good ones going. Can you tell us a bit on that approach? Definitely. And I mean, this is, this is one that's not patented, so I don't think you can patent an approach on here. So we can chat freely on this. Yes. <laughs> freely. Um, yes. Yes. So I, absolutely. I like it because I think goals are for people that want to succeed once and systems are for people that want to succeed all the time. And when you have a system in place that allows you to objectively approach ideas and approach devices and approach technologies and companies, that allows you a little bit more of an objective lens. And I think maybe many of the people on the podcast can relate from the medical community, the FEV ratio, which is a throwback to, I think, Palm and Palm Crit Care, which has obviously become important during the pandemic. But we coined the acronym over here, the FEV, that's F is in Frank, E is in Edward, V is in Victor, um, as an acronym. And that stands for feasibility, 
efficacy, and viability. And that sort of framework allows us to identify on a score of zero to 10 in each of those categories for a total score of 30, which is totally arbitrary, by the way, as most things in the world are, they're just arbitrarily made up. But this one allows us to assess how feasible is this? Does the technology exist? Or are we talking about something so futuristic, we're looking 10, 20 years in the future? Efficacy, is this a one-year project? Is this a two week project that we can bootstrap and get a prototype together? Or is this something that's gonna take a serious amount of engineering work, computer science work, funding from an efficacy standpoint? How quickly can we take this to market? And then V for viability, is this a viable product or idea? Is this a viable technology? Do people even need this? Sure, it's great to think up something cool like a new scalpel that might address something that's different for something in the surgical suite, but do people even want it? Is anyone going to pay for that once it hits market? And does anyone even really truly need that? Or is that just something that we are maybe enamored with in our own world because it's our idea? So I think when you break those things down and really look at something through an objective lens, that helps guide which one of those shots on goal that you have. And more importantly, pausing there and taking a bit of a sidestep back to the, the more 10 plus year time horizon. All of these shots on goal when they fail, the reason why it's important to be an obsessive or someone who's obsessed with these results is when they fail and they inevitably always will, you need to learn something from that. And that learning process, if you are someone that's maybe more extrinsically motivated by the financial reward or the accolade reward, that's never going to work in the long run. You need to be very much intrinsically motivated because when those failures come, if you're the person that gives up, well, you kind of left that lesson on the table. When you can take that lesson, things learn, different processes learn, and apply that to the next device that may be totally different or the next company that may be completely unrelated. But now you have this skill set that's accumulating over a lifetime, helping you to become a better entrepreneur, a better physician scientist and physician entrepreneur to build things worth building. So I think that's a good system for maybe anyone younger listening or even older listening to really identify some of these things and take a stab at it, go for it, build the future that you're envisioning. You know, what's really cool, Michael, I've met a couple of people that were obviously very young and you, you know, always hear about those folks, but I know a couple of people that were in their seventies and they started ingredient companies that have done exceptionally well. You know, some, some ingredients that really like went above and beyond what the expectations would have been and now are starting to become widely used in the, you know, OTC space. And, you know, they were saying uh, it was uh, very inspiring. They were like 70 something. They were like, you know, I still got a good 30 years in me. I got stuff to do. <laughs> and I thought, well, there you go, right? I guess once the entrepreneurial spirit, always the entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I got a question for you. Where yeah. do you get your funding? Because obviously this isn't free to be able to do these things. Where do you turn or where do people typically turn if they don't want to go the VC route? Yeah. So it's a very fair question. I think we're in a real technological boom here in the best way where the cost of doing business is now cheaper than it's almost ever been. Kind of example in point, the cost of doing a podcast like recording like this, if you went back to the 1950s, well, you need to have a television news anchor network. We would have to all fly into the same place and there'd be a team of 35 people. That, that, and we'd that have would... different voices, Michael. We'd probably have one of those 50s voices going. Yeah, I like it. I like it there. <laughs> and I'd have Roger grow a mustache. There we go. Yes. And I, we'd wear double breasted suits and it would be a good time. <laughs> Conjuring up Anchorman vibes right now. But all jokes <laughs> aside, I think really the opportunity in the device development space is better than it's ever been. Uh, from a funding standpoint, there are a lot of ways to do things from a bootstrapped standpoint. Uh, and I think I would encourage people to pursue that. If you're trying to 3D print and prototype a device, you can now do that for pennies on the dollar, as opposed to previously, you'd have to do some casting, some modeling, have a contract with a manufacturing plant. That's just one case and an example. Other examples, including some of the work that we're doing in artificial intelligence, it costs literally the only server costs are what we do through AWS. And that's not exactly cheap, but it's also not as expensive as one would think. So funding comes in from different avenues. 
my personal philosophy is that as far away as you can keep funding and keep it as independent as possible, that is the better approach. And I think venture capital is much more receptive to that. Once you start being tied up with NIH grants and DOD grants and R's and K's and everything in between, it gets extremely messy and it gets a little less attractive to invest in and a little less viable back to that FEV sort of scoring to take something legitimately to market. If you're able to do something in an independent setting and take that all the way through that, that's preferred on there. But from a funding standpoint, to answer your question concisely, comes from all over the place, sometimes from nowhere, and sometimes from personal finances on things that you believe in so much that you're willing to bankroll that to a certain extent, which isn't easy. I'm not even remotely misconstruing my place in the universe with Elon Musk, but everyone famously remembers his story of after he sold PayPal, part of it as one of the co-founders, he took almost every penny that he had to his name and reinvested that into companies that he believed in. And those panned out as Tesla, SpaceX, and Solar City, which was then subsequently acquired. And now I guess today acquiring successfully Twitter. But the point being is if you believe in an idea, the same way if you believe in you know your own child or your own family member, there's nothing that you won't do to try to support that any way that you can to take that all the way through. And that goes back to that sort of obsession to a somewhat pathological level that you really have to have that belief because when the chips are up, it's great. But when your 19th experiment fails, funding is to a zero, no one cares, no one believes in it. Well, that's really where the real test comes in. Another thing comes to mind that the term leader you're not really a leader until it's a moment of crisis. Until then, you're just someone who's in charge. That's so apt. And I want to bring this now to dermatology. Yeah. And perhaps you can share with us from your you know, neck of the woods, what technologies you see that are emerging that will be very exciting in the next 10, 20 years within dermatology? Yeah. So one, I want to start with a little brief history on there because I think it's so important. Again, it's easy to look at success stories and it's hard to forget just how hard it was. The pulse dye laser, Rox Anderson, genius invention, my mentor, boss, et cetera. And one of the reasons why I went into dermatology. The pulse dye laser, for those that are listening that aren't familiar with it, is a laser that we use to treat all sorts of vascular lesions, malformations, rosacea, port wine birthmarks, you name it. And it's used pretty rapidly and we can kind of cover the whole face and pulse through and treat things quite successfully now. What I've loved about this fellowship up here in this year is really hearing those origin stories. How were things really built and how did that pan out? You know, for years, Rox was biking on a bicycle miles and miles and miles just to go to tinker in a garage to try to build this device. And I'll let him tell that story because he's closest to it. But this is just my secondhand recount of it. When the laser was first developed, and again, this is now one of the most widely used lasers on planet Earth. When it was first developed, each pulse that it fired, so each shot that it fired, it would take seconds to spool all the way up and then a minute or so before you could even fire that pulse. And that was just based on the technological limitation. After one single pulse, you then have to wait about five, 10 minutes to fire another pulse. To put that in perspective, most port wine birthmarks, we're using anywhere from 100 to 500 pulses to treat. So you can do the math, but I don't know if 500 minutes of sitting at a bedside is exactly an efficacious treatment. So that's a huge limitation that took years to identify how can you introduce a different chemical to prolong the excited state of the photons to allow for more rapid pulses. My point of saying all that is, again, it's easy to look at a success story and it's harder to look at where all those failures were along the way that were necessary to take it there. The last thing that I'll close on there, and then we'll get to current innovations and what I'm very excited for, for the near future that we can talk about in a public space. The technology for the pulse dye laser, that was sitting on the fence for a little while and sitting on the shelf. It was just a matter of identifying those things that needed to be pieced together to create that technology. And I think as a quotation we've talked about before, but I love it and I remind myself of it daily, that talent hits the target that no one else can hit, but genius hits the target that no one else can see. 
And that genius in seeing those seemingly unrelated things in innovation are points that allow us to push devices forward. One device that I am so excited for, and I think will play a massive role in the very near and distant future coming up, it's currently FDA approved. This is the, uh, I guess we'll use trade names on here because it's a, a podcast format and feel free to edit as you see fit. From the company Citrellus, this is the Elicor device, which does tissue microcoring, takes out thousands and thousands of microscopic cores from the face for treating the mid face and lower face from rides, skin laxity, jowling and everything in between. The technology, again, getting back from a Feynman principle standpoint, much, much more of a concise question and a problem that was worth solving. It was the mid 2000s, mid 2010s, and we still in dermatology didn't have the answer to this question. How big of a hole can we make and not cause a scar? You'd kind of think that we might have gotten around to doing that research at a detailed level all the way to that time in you know the mid 2010s, but we didn't have a concise answer. And that question tugging on that thread was the genesis of this device, because the beauty of it is after all those tens of thousands of cores that we removed from the face and potentially throughout the body as we continue to conduct further research on there for other indications is there's no scar. The micro excision, if you will, these punch excisions that it does rapidly from a device standpoint are taken out at 410 microns in diameter. And that was the answer to the question really below 500 microns in diameter, but really the sweet spot being closer to 410. So by doing all of that, we now have an FDA approved device that Rox Anderson invented and a couple of the other team members over at Harvard, also in the plastic surgery department, and that's to market. I think that's going to play a massive role, not just in tissue tightening, but also in skin laxity, in scars, in wound healing, because now we can use these micro cores and reintroduce those potentially in vitiligo, potentially in drug delivery. The list goes on for the opportunities that this device has, and I'm extremely excited to see where the future goes with this company and this device. Yes, and I can say from firsthand, we have one of the iterations of this technology and research right now, and having used that, it's really remarkable seeing patients here. You know, I have one of those patients come back a year later. So just to be specific, this is technology that allows you to take these micro columns that are full thickness, meaning they go all the way down to the fat and get those out of the patient's skin and introduce them back into the wound. Now you look at that and then a patient comes back a year later and they don't even remember where the procedure was. You can't see it. You can't tell where it was. They say, ah, I think I, you took it from my leg or something. And uh, <laughs> so just the thought of a scarless full thickness is really mind boggling and seeing it right there. You know, Michael, I heard you talk about the concept of artificial intelligence versus augmented intelligence, especially when it comes to the visual data collection aspect in dermatology. Can you briefly tell us about this concept? I think plays a role specifically when we try to diagnose skin cancers and other rashes. Absolutely. I think that's a lot of where the future is headed on there. It's tough. And I'll say, I guess as a disclosure, I'm on the American Academy of Dermatology's task force for artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence. So we try to do our best to steer and guide that in the correct direction. I think in the next 10 years, it's absolutely going to be ubiquitous. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And I'm optimistic that it'll allow a much more democratized delivery of healthcare, not replacing dermatology in any real capacity, but really augmenting some of that care and helping to expedite patient care. I think a specific example that's come out of the MIT uh, research group up here that we've tried to work with and collaborate with is trying to introduce this sort of screening technology in already existing things in your home. Things like a mirror that's already there. If you could buy from the Apple store an additional camera that you just put into your mirror and now every day without you doing anything, it effectively takes an overview augmented surveillance stratifying, and this is published, this is in the public sector, a stratification of whether these are low, medium, or potentially high risk pigmented lesions. And then it would provide some sort of recommendation or suggestion. Hey, by the way, Hadar has some availability next Thursday in the afternoon. If you'd like to book that appointment with him, please answer in the affirmative on your Amazon Alexa so we can address this most post haste. 
Now that might sound a little black mirror dystopian future, but I think that's something that we can do at a system wide level and at a healthcare nationwide level that will have a tangible impact in detecting malignancies earlier, identifying inflammatory conditions earlier, and other things of the like. I definitely don't think it's a panacea, but I think it's pretty cool. And one of the things that I'm trying to introduce, which has been an onerous task from a technology standpoint, is combining that machine vision with lasers and energy-based devices, or really anything for that matter, and any procedure for that matter. So using effectively cameras to associate with robotic articulated arms with lasers attached to them to identify lesions, treat them to an appropriate endpoint, and then identify that that endpoint has been treated. I think starting with the benign lesions that we are like cherry angiomas and laser hair removal, that's one thing, but I think you can then start to extrapolate that to more onerous tasks and potentially even things that are a little bit more outlandish, like laser treatment of non-melanoma skin cancers, potentially. I'm not endorsing that and I'm not saying that that is the way things are headed, but I think when you start to look at things creatively and place a little bit of faith in the technology continuing to improve, when you look out on the 10-year and 20-year time horizon, that's very much in the realm of reality. And can have a huge impact in dermatology and beyond. Well, Michael, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this podcast. I think we've learned quite a bit in a short amount of time, and I really, really love your infectious energy that really has been a pleasure to get to know you when you were training in Miami, and you bring that passion, that obsession you were talking about, and if there's a way to infect others, you certainly have the ability to do that. So thank you for joining us, for educating us, and I'm so excited to see what the 10, 20 years horizon will show on Dr. Brooks. So well, thank you. We'll meet you in a couple of years. There we go. Well, thank you again, Hadar and Raja. It's been an honor and such an honor knowing you guys over the years and really looking forward to more. And you know, if there's a better future out there, it's our responsibility to build it. So I'm looking forward to hopefully building a couple things with you guys and helping to create the future. So these long shots are never as long as they seem. You guys have a great night over there and we'll always be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Raja, do you know where the integrative medicine movement started? According to Google, since Google knows everything, Dr. Andrew Wheel founded the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona in Tucson back in 1994. Why do you ask? Well, you know how we always try to get to the root cause? I think we need to go big for the fifth, my friend, fifth annual Integrative Dermatology Symposium. How about we do this? Let's meet at the Lowe's Ventana Canyon Resort in Tucson, Arizona. Or you can join virtually from September 30th to October 2nd and hear from the world-renowned experts like Andrew Weil. Exciting, and our theme is connecting mind, body, and spirit to take a more holistic approach to our patient care. What do you say? Absolutely, I mean, where else can you get the latest on diet and dermatology, hypnosis, botanicals, common diseases, aesthetics, and other unique topics in dermatology with practical takeaways to start using in clinic right away? So true. And let's not forget, we've got the new track for estheticians too. I think I'm going to need to call in a sick day or two before the symposium so I can enjoy the waterfall and trails on the resort, stargaze, play a round or two of golf or tennis, relax at the spa, and catch up with colleagues at the evening receptions. Yes, that place is spectacular. You know, use our discount code POD25 at checkout for 25% off. 